know, typically on Sunday nights, uh, we do our discipleship at 6.30. We're not going to do that tonight. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue preaching this message tonight. If you want to come, if you've got other uh, things going on, you can. But I, I believe it's important, so I'm not going to. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you a, a full plate this morning, but I'm definitely not going to rush it. Uh, because I believe there's some things in this that there's just no way I could do justice to what I feel like God's dropped in my spirit. And, and I feel like we need to get this stuff in in preparation for what I believe is going to be really a dynamic time next week as far as our, our leadership university with Dr. Uh, Tao and, and Pastor Ravenhill coming in. And so uh, tonight, 630, we're together back in. And uh, I'm going uh, to short, short just a little amount of praise and worship. Praise team, if you would, 15 to 20 minutes. And I'm going to uh, continue this message and we'll see if it wraps up then or we continue again, so we'll see what Jesus does. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the that opening uh, book of Genesis. Some of you guys that are, and I hope most of you are, if you're not, uh, repent and get on board with the 90-day challenge. I, seriously, there's just no reason not to. If you're not in the Word, uh, you've got time. There is. It's, it's, it's really just a, a brief commitment. Uh, we make commitments to everything else under the sun. We do the 90-day challenge, getting through the Word of God in 90 days. You find out once you've done it once, twice, a dozen times, that it's just a matter of just discipline. It's not a matter of an enormous amount of time. You can do that. I know some are getting together. And they're taking turns reading a chapter and things of that nature. You need to get in it. If you don't and you struggle, it's your own fault. It really is. You know, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. You show me a person that struggles, I'll show you a person that's not in the Word of God. Period. Show me a person that, that don't understand, that's having issues, I'll show you a person that's not committed to God's Word. Period. It's not rocket science. It's just the obvious effect. So you need to get into that word. If you folks that are watching us online, want that to send me a message, I'll give you the 90-day challenge uh, reading uh, uh, program, and you can find yourself reading cover to cover four times a year if you'll just commit yourself to it. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, it says this, and it says, And the Lord said to Abram, he said, Leave your native country. He said, Leave your relatives and your father's family. Go to the land in which I'm going to show you. This is in verse 2. He gives a promise, begins to state, make the statement to Abraham. Abram at this time, he says, I will make you a great nation. He said, I will bless you. I'll make you famous. And he said, you'll be a blessing to other people as well. And he said, I will bless those that bless you, and I'll curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families of the earth will be, a bless, be blessed through you. Verse 4, so Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. In other words, he got in agreement with God. Somebody say he got in agreement with God. He got in agreement with God. And it says, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he left. Folks, listen, if somebody's in agreement with God, I want to go with them. You hear me? I want to go with that. You know, folks, I, I, I know personally uh, that I, I've seen things that God has showed me in the future. I'm not saying that I'm a prophet. I'm just saying God's given me glimpses of things that I know are going to come to pass. It makes my life real easy. And, you know, I've talked to you before about, you know, we're seated with him according to uh, the, the book of Ephesians in heavenly places. And so we just work backwards to obedience. And within that, God will give you glimpses of certain things that you know of, right? That he shows you certain things that are going to come to pass. As long as you stay on that pathway, you, you can expect God to be faithful over his word, especially the word that he specifically reveals to you. And so there's a destiny associated with that. And so there's a safety in walking in the will of God. You know, we sing a song about that. You know, your will is this, your will and your desire. There's a safety and there's a victory in the will of God. If you're not in the will of God, folks, listen, you're not just taking a chance. You're setting yourself on a beeline for destruction. You really are. And so when we, we talk about this is the will of God or sanctification, literally sanctification needs to be set apart for his service. In other words, to find yourself placed in agreement with God's will. You're not outside of God's will. You find yourself getting run over by truck, so to speak. And so... When I'm in agreement with God or I can act in agreement with him, there's a safety. So, you know, if I'm doing something God's told me to do, praise God, I'm with that. If I'm doing something outside of God's will, there's, there's a danger associated. I want to say that real quick. So it says, so uh, Abram departed as the Lord had disturbed. He got in agreement with God's will. And Lot, was, his nephew, was smart enough to follow the one that was in the will of God. Period. He was sharp enough to understand that Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. And it says, he took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people who had taken into, the house, into his household at Haran, and headed for the land of Canaan. And when he arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through all the land as far as Shechem, and there he set up camp beside the Oak of Morah. At that time, there were inhabited, this land was inhabited by the Canaanites. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give you this land for your descendants. 
And Abram built an altar there, and he dedicated the Lord who had appeared unto him. And after that, somebody say after that. After that. Abram traveled south and set up camp in the hill country with Bethel to the west of Ai, to the east. And there he built an altar, and he dedicated it unto the Lord, and he worshipped the Lord. Somebody say he worshipped the Lord. He worshipped the Lord. In verse 9, to finish out our text this morning, it says, And Abram continued south by stages towards Negev. Folks, listen, listen, this is the time of year that I kind of personally... I really, honestly, just kind of use it to a time to, to kind of refresh myself, to kind of recalibrate and kind of get uh, really my bearings in, in regards to what God has spoken. I do. I take a pause. I say, listen, I've had a real busy 12 months, so to speak. You know, a lot of things have been going on. A lot of things have been happening. It's like you're, you're fighting on the fly. And I always want to take kind of pause and say, God, okay. Is there, is there any place that I uh, delineated from your, your course for me? And I need to bring myself back to really kind of the true north. I need to find myself uh, in, in the exact place that you've called me to be. And so this is always kind of a good place to do and begin to, to weigh and to measure those things in the balance. And so there's some things by, that God really, in regards to kind of vision, directive, um, and I might even use the term, since we're talking about Abraham, uh, uh, promise, uh, kind of describe the basic idea, but really, I, I guess the, the thing that I would say is, how do I make sure that the path or direction that I'm walking in is consistent with that which God has for my life? And I'll say that again, how can I make sure that the path or the directive that God has for me, that I'm walking consistent with his will? Mm -hmm. Folks, we talk about many times, we, we preach it uh, 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 so, so often about there's that way from Proverbs 14, 12, you know the verse well, that seems right. It seems like I'm on course, but the end thereof are the way of death. It don't start out bad, but it ends up in a place that I never desired. So it's so important to, to really have your bearings straight. And so there's certain times that I believe that God just kind of shuts out all the background noise. If, if somebody is not, A, not in the Word, B, has multiple distractions in their life, and think that they're getting a, a clear directive on the will of God, folks, what you're going to see is this person's life going just like this. How do I know that? Because I've been there and done that. Mm -hmm. Period. We let all this other stuff in, and somehow you're speaking so authoritatively. Folks, listen, when you're on point in your relationship with God, sometimes it's still difficult to know exactly what God's saying. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and so we know that. So Amos 3.3 3 says, how can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? There's got to be an agreement on the direction that God has placed upon your life. So the question should be, can someone truly walk with God when they're not on the course that God is on? Can you walk with God if you're not on the course that God is on? And so God's course is very laid out for us. It's very clear where God's going. I, I remember years ago, I was preaching on Bourbon Street, just like we do every single week. And uh, I asked a guy, I said, so are you walking with the Lord? He said, every day. And he'd just come out of a strip club. I said, well, that's interesting. I didn't know God hung out in those type of places. Yeah. You know, I didn't know that that was where he frequented. I didn't know that, that, that God was, uh, was on a course of compromise, that God was on a, a, a course of, uh, of drunkenness and, and sexual immorality. I didn't realize that that where God was. Or can we get to where God desires if we abandon the direction in which God is guiding us? And so do we think for a minute that God is providing guidance into our life and we can abandon the guidance that God has given through the, the, the person of the Holy Spirit in our life and through the other vehicles that God is using in our life and somehow think that we're going to get into God's will. And so the biblical story of, of Abraham and the eventual covenant that God would make with him, uh, you know, for us, it's, it's very well known. You know, you read the Bible, especially you guys that, that are reading through, even if you don't finish, the good news is, is you always get to Genesis if you're starting reading the Bible. So you always at least get that. And so it's very well known. It's a very foundational story in the, in the Old Testament. And, and I like to think of it kind of is, it's kind of like this. It's, it's after the fall, right? Mm -hmm. But it was before the law. Yeah. Okay. So I'm looking at this story. This is why it means much to me. It's after the fall. But it's before the law. So it's in that period of time where there's a lot of application that I can bring into my own life, even though it's Old Testament. And so it was before the flood, right? Right. But it was genuinely after the blood because he had already offered a, a, a sacrifice right here. And so we see these places that we can draw from. And sometimes when we look at the Old Testament, it's kind of easy to kind of displace ourselves because we say that's a different time. But with this, there's something very clear. And this is the story of how God desired 
to have a relationship with a man and how faith became that preeminent component in that relationship. So regardless of where it's at, all these ages ago, 5,000 years ago, uh, it, and we see 4,000 years ago, and we see what happened. Nonetheless, we see that faith was that preeminent component for it. And folks, I'm here to tell you, you know what Hebrews 11, 6 tells us right there when he's speaking in the Hall of Fame and the, the patriarchs and the matriarchs. He says, but without faith, the same faith that Abraham had, without faith, it's what? Impossible, Impossible to please him. That those that come to him, those that line up and get on the same course with God, those that are in agreement with him, according to Amos 3.3, 3, are in God's will, moving in God's direction, seeing God do the things in their life. It says, without that type of faith and believing that he is a, a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. We've got to believe that he is. And he rewards us when we're diligent in, in staying to that course. And so the, 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 this facet of man's relationship with God, faith, we see it introduced and it was initiated through God's relationship with Abram. So if you want to know where faith was birthed, it's right here. Faith was birthed in this man that chose to believe God. And so the first three verses of Genesis chapter 12 begin with a conversation. And we'll be coming back to that periodically. And here's what the Lord said to Abram. He said, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land which I will show you. He said, I'll make uh, unto you a great nation. I will bless you, and I'll make you famous. You'll be a blessing to other people. I'll bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. And you can pause right there. If you need to put a title for this, this message, if I need to call it that, it's going to be the Ishmael effect. And we're not even going to get to that this morning, but it's going to be the Ishmael effect. And you're going to see... The, the covenant established, established, the promise established, just like we all see it in our life when we come to Christ, then something ends up happening that has a tendency to divert us from those promises that God has for us. So look what he said. And before we go much further, he said, I, I, I want you to look at some of these promises that Abraham got, who obviously was then Abram, that were associated with this conversation that he began to have with God. Number one, he said, I will make of you a great nation. So here he is in this faith conversation with God, and, and things are happening. God is speaking to this man. All of a sudden, uh, God begins to give him some, some things to look forward to. He begins to show him a picture that's afar off. Folks, listen, do you, do, you, do you remember even when you first came to that experience with Christ? Do you remember when faith arose inside of you? And suddenly it's like, man, the, the colors in the room looked more vibrant. There was a lightness that, that came upon you. The heaviness began to lift. It was like you got this, this, this instantaneous all flash of something that was, that was all too fleeting. And you thought to yourself, man, I, could just, I wish I could just hold this window open. And this thing that seems like it's, it's closing down on me. But, but you remember that time that God gave you the, the, the opportunity to see him in a way that probably Adam got to see him before the fall. Unencumbered by sin. Folks, that's the influence of grace that comes upon our life. That's that divine influence. It's an awe flash. Suddenly, a, a, a person, a people that their hearts are deceitful and wicked above all things. Suddenly, a, a people that are, 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 are birthed into to that sin nature. And these people that are consequentially can't know God, can't, uh, can't choose God. Suddenly, because of the grace of God, there's a window that's opened. Boom! God brings us to the place that we can see things. Then when you come to that place of salvation, it's like, man, everything. It's like, man, God, I want to do whatever I can to, to, to follow you. But something's happened, I believe, it, culturally in the church. Because, folks, listen, that's what the message look, used to look like. The message caused people to say, hey, listen, whatever it takes, I'm going to follow Jesus. Whatever it costs me, I'm going to follow Jesus. And people, I would see people come to Christ and immediately they were just willing to abandon everything for the cause of Christ. Now, rather than people coming to an altar and abandoning things for a cause of Christ, they just find something else to, to, to write down in their portfolio or something else to schedule in their daily planner. It doesn't become, listen, man, I'm done with my life. God, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to go to the, to, to the darkest places of Africa and preach the gospel. Lord God, I'm willing to, 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 to travail land and sea to let people know about Jesus. Folks, listen, I rarely see that response of people coming to Christ any longer. Why? Because the message has been so changed. It became, rather than you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow him, it's become the best life now. 
God wants to fix your situation rather than just to eliminate you through, from, through the process and let Christ uh, abound in you. So the message has changed. So the response to the message has changed as well. But he said, I will make you a great nation. He said, I will bless you. Anybody want to be blessed? You want to be blessed? And we'll get into what that means in just a bit. He said, I'll make you famous in a different way than what you may be thinking. He said, you'll be a blessing to others. He said, I'll bless those that bless you, and I'll curse those that curse you. And he said, and you will be the key wherein all subsequent families of the earth will be blessed. You hear that? And so those seven blessings should be a part of of any vision or directive that any of desire for the kingdom of God. Those seven blessings that he gave Abraham, those things could be extended to us. That covenant that we have with him as children now of Abraham that have been adopted in the blood and has been extended unto us. If you want to say to yourself, listen, God has given me a vision. If it does not contain those type of components, it's not God's type of vision. God's type of vision is always... Uh, 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 involves those things that are inherent to God's character. God does not have a wishy-washy vision. So if he says, and I'll use that last one, you will be the key that all subsequent families of earth will be blessed. In other words, the way that you've seen it, the, 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 the things that have been extended to you, the things that you've benefited from are going to benefit other people as well. And But those seven blessings, if they're going to be a part of it, we should, he should say to ourselves, listen to what it is. Here's how we can apply it. We should always desire to be fruitful, right? I'll make you a great nation. I want to be fruitful. We should always desire to be multiplied. I will bless you. We should desire to have a tremendous testimony. I'll make you famous. Do you see how it applies to us? You should desire to be givers. In other words, you're going to be blessed. You should desire to have the favor of the Lord. Other people are going to be a blessing to you. You should desire the protection of the Lord. In other words, those that curse you, I'm going to curse. And you should desire to be the conduit for God's plan here on planet earth. Folks, listen, when we begin to put value to our vision, there's something that keeps us on that pathway. Do you hear me? I've talked many times about just my experiences in, in the pastoral ministry. And there were times, listen, man, man dark challenges, battles in the, in the, in, in the spiritual realm. Well, you know we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this age, and spiritual wickedness in high places. But I'll tell you, you know, listen, uh, there, there, there was battles. At times there was darkness, and the only people that knew about those things was my wife and I. And as the enemy was trying to come in and just attack my heart and attack my mind in the midst of it. And I think to myself, you know what? Man, I'm discouraged. I think I'm going to get up in the pulpit today and just, just lay everybody out. Just put, hammer them down. And man, then I have to put my big boy pants on and sit there and think, you know what? Man, I've been ministering to my neighborhood all week. And I invited that one guy that's just hanging on by a thread. And here I am complaining about this, this attack that the enemy has put up on me. And I'm going to get up here and I'm going to fold up. And that guy's in the back of the church, just hanging on for dear life, needing to hear a word. And he's going to look up here and say, listen, if the preacher can't even do it, what makes me think that I can? I had to quit myself like a man and say, you know what? There ain't no way I'm going to be defined by my problem. I'm going to be defined by the promises of God. Why? Because I had a clear directive. It was there based upon faith. And I, and I said the other day, listen, guys, I don't do all these years into it. I don't do discouragement very well. I just don't. But I do faith real well. Discouragement is just not something that I like to keep in my wheelhouse. You know, maybe I'm just the eternal optimist because of the blood of Jesus. And maybe just because I, I, I've committed myself to, to realize that I'm seated with him in, in heavenly places. And that's my directive. It's just like, you know what? Come hell or high water or difficulty or unmet expectations. You know what? My goal is right up there where Jesus is. And all these other things, should they come or should they go? Listen, I know where my focus is going to be. And I want to walk in agreement with him. Do you hear me? Because that's it. And so if a thousand fall on one side and a ten thousand on the other, listen, I'm not going to find myself swerving to the left or to the right. Why? Because when I was lost, I did discourage me real well. But man, I'm, I'm, I'm saved by grace through faith. And so I can do faith well. Why? Because it's been uh, 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 placed into the very fabric of my being. 
But folks, those seven promises did not come until they were prefaced by three conditions. And look what he said. He gave three conditions in order to walk in the seven promises that he gave Abraham. You want to walk in those promises? Well, watch yourself because he gave conditions to those then, and he's about to give them to you now. He said, number one, he said, you've got to leave your home country. I'll describe those things uh, and how they apply to us in just a second. Secondly, he said, you've got to leave your extended family. And thirdly, he said, you've got to leave your immediate family. Folks, there's been big decisions that Melly and I've had to make in, in, in our lives and in our relationship with the Lord, period. And some of them were very specific, and they kind of looked like that in the natural. But, folks, there's spiritual implications to those three conditions that I believe. It, it wasn't like Melly and I saying, you know what? Man, we spent much of our life. Man, our mom and dad live in, in, in the panhandle of Texas in Amarillo. And so, you know, in order to have the promises of God, it, it means vacating the premises of a place where we graduated high school, we got married, uh, a couple of our children were born, we spent many years, that's where we entered into the pastor. Yeah, that was, a, that was kind of our home country, so to speak. But, but there's deeper implications than that. And so I want you to look at the progression that was tied to the promise and how it went from this very broad, broad to a very personal and how the way to the will of God became narrower and narrower over the course of this conversation, not wider and less demanding. Did, did you pick up on this? Leave your country, leave your extended family, leave your immediate family. Folks, listen, I believe that the trap that disqualifies many from truly seeing the manifestation of the promises of God and the fulfillment of vision is thinking that the biggest sacrifice is that which is offered up front in the relationship. Do you hear me? I think the biggest trap that believers fall into of all ilks and all persuasions is thinking that the biggest sacrifice that you're going to make to God is that one up front. Mm. Folks, you have a picture of it in the, in the Old Testament, even within the, 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 the temple. You know, here we are, uh, David desired to, to, to build a dwelling place for God. And he pulled out all the stops. All of this tremendous wealth was coming forth and, and gold and silver and bronze and all of these things. And so he handed those off to his son Solomon. And Solomon erected the, this enormous temple. And, and, and all of these, if you'll just do the numbers and the, the, the amount of sacrifices, the, the street had to have ran like a river of blood because of the amount of animals that were sacrificed that day. Enormous sacrifice. So they could have said to themselves, you know what? There's just never at the temple or the place of worship, man, the biggest sacrifice was up front. Probably what they thought. You know why? Because I don't see in the scripture where that was ever duplicated. Period. They never had the, the t literally tens of thousands of animals were brought. Never, never duplicated. So they probably thought to themselves, listen, it's, it's, it's the, the biggest sacrifice was that up front. And they, they, they looked with nostalgia. They looked and they thought to themselves, you remember when? But folks, even after the destruction of the temple and the rebuilding and all these things that happened, what did he say? He said, the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former. Why? Because there's a bigger sacrifice. And so even though the street ran wet with blood because of the, the blood of bulls and of lambs and of birds, folks, Golgotha's hill ran red with the blood of the lamb slain before the foundations of yes. the world. So the sacrifice didn't get easier. The sacrifice got much greater. Yes. Even though the first sacrifice was designed to cover and put off man's sin. Folks, listen, that's not the sacrifice that ushered us into a place of, of revelation and redemption that would come later. And folks, listen, even though there's, a, there's, there's an idea that when we come to Christ and men were just laying those things down, folks, listen, that's not the biggest Sacrifice. I've heard many mature, immature believers make statements like this. Maybe you said this. I have already given up everything. I've already given up everything. And that's just a short while into their walk with God. Folks, listen, I've got news for you. I'm still having to give up everything. You hear me? I'm still having to give up everything. I didn't come to a place and say, okay, God, is this enough? That it had to finally come. I'm, I'm having to give. I'm having to give up my time. I'm having to give up my thoughts. I'm having to give up the the desires of my flesh. I'm having to give up every single thing and bring those things as a sacrifice to present myself. Paul the apostle said, "Listen, I crucify myself every single day." Yes. 
Every day I give up everything. Every day I give up my hopes and my dreams and my aspirations. Why? Because unless I can give those things up, I can't walk in agreement with where he wants to take me. Do you hear me? Is that a bad thing? No, that's a good thing. And so what they really mean when people say I've already given up everything is I've already left my home country or I've decided to choose heaven over hell. Folks, that's what leaving your home country means spiritually. It's like, okay, listen, I don't want to go to hell anymore. So you know what I think I'm going to do? I'm going to leave my home country, which was hell, and I'm going to choose to go to another country, another land, which is heaven. And so without really giving up their extended family or associations with the world or their immediate family or those things in their own life that would keep them from the promises of God. That's what they're saying. I'm, I want heaven, but I'm not willing to take the other two requirements to get to that promised land. And so most of those here today in this place, and maybe those that are listening today or later, have likely left their home family or made the decision to believe in Jesus and get saved. Probably without exception in this room, and, and, and maybe for those that would see a preacher on here and stop and listen for a minute on Facebook. So most of us have made the decision, listen, that I want to get saved. Many have likely separated themselves from their extended family or maybe even their extended influences. You say, listen, well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't go party anymore. I don't go to the beer joint anymore. I don't, I don't do some of the things that I used to do. I'm not having sex outside of marriage anymore. I'm not smoking pot. I'm not doing drugs. I'm, I'm not doing a lot of the things that I used to do. I've left my, my extended family. And so all the bad things, the worst things, I'm not doing those things anymore. But fewer have left the immediate family of their own hidden thoughts, iniquities, and ambitions. You hear me? Folks, it's easy to choose heaven over hell. It is. Why? Because then I can bring everything along with me. It's easy to make that choice. And it's easy to, to get rid of the big stuff. The, the big stuff that may be not culturally acceptable within the confines of the church. Those are, those are things that, you know what, it takes a little bit of, of getting used to. But those things are easy to get rid of. And so many find it easy to abandon an action just as long as they can keep alive a thought. Don't need to say that again. Many people are willing to abandon the action just as long as they can keep alive the thought. Folks, listen, we're instructed to bring every thought captive to the obedience of God. Don't be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed, Romans 12, 2, by the renewing of your mind so you can know the good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. So if you think you can just abandon the action, but maintain the thought, folks, listen, what you've done is you've just kept yourself just to, uh, leaving the home country, and maybe the extended family, but never uh, leaving the immediacy of your mind. Folks, listen, he wasn't just wounded for your transgressions and bruised for your iniquities, the chastisement for your peace and the way that you think was also laid upon him. Yet the instruction or the requirement for Abraham and for us in order to reach the promises of God was to leave even those thoughts and desires. Let me ask you a question just quickly. What are the thoughts and the desires that have stopped you in your path? What are the flesh pots of Egypt that you find yourself longing for, not in action, but in thought? Do you hear me? Why? Because, folks, the way you die is to be led away by your own lust, your own thoughts. I'm just going to keep those things filed away because I may need them sometime. But a young lady uh, that was here, and, and most of you guys knew her at one point, and came from a kind of a tough background, tough situation, and she wanted to come and, and, and live here. And so she did, and we, I mean, we really pulled out all the stops and made some major sacrifices in order for this to happen, drove many, many miles for those type of things, and and, you know, it seemed very sincere. I mean, there, there were people in favor of the Lord that was happening, get, getting into schools and them waiving all the fees and the tuition. I mean, it's enormous things that many people went to, to do on her behalf. But and so she left home country. She wanted to get saved. And a lot of the things that she found herself normally doing in her extended family, so to speak, she came from a background, some, some drugs and some involvement and some certain things. But you know what? She kept herself 
this relationship that she had back home. Now, she didn't tell anybody about it because she knew that there were certain criteria, certain rules about, you know, I'm going to, uh, you, you can't text with, with, with members of the opposite sex. You got to have, but so she just did those things more in a clandestine fashion because she always thought to herself, what if something happens and I go back? I want that boyfriend back. Well, and that's what she did. She maintained the thought, even though she separated herself from the action. And folks, it wasn't just a week after she went back that she found herself right back in the same relationship. She found herself fearful and pregnant, found herself taking the, the, the morning after pill. Why? Because she decided in her mind that I'm going to hold on to a thought, even though it wasn't the action. Folks, now years later, she's gone down a, a path that she calls herself uh, an atheist-leaning agnostic. Because she really don't believe, she won't call herself an atheist because she was discipled enough to know that she doesn't have all the information. But at the same time, she has no fear of God, no desire of God. Why? Because just stopping the action doesn't change the attitude unless we're willing to abandon those things that are intimate to us and they'll eventually keep, catch up with you. So, verse 4, so Abram departed as the Lord had instructed. In other words, he had acted in agreement with God, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. And he took his wife Sarah, Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all his people. He had taken his household in Haran and headed for the land of Canaan. So, in other words, Abraham started moving in the right direction. He started moving the way that he needed to need to move. He was making progress. But, folks, listen. Progress is not the same as promise. Do I need to say that again? Your progress is not the same as your promise. Because, folks, a lot of times you'll, you'll count up and you'll say, well, listen, I'm making progress, or I'm only human, or, I, or I'm not where I used to be. Well, folks, listen, you can stop right there and find yourself just as destitute as you were from where you began. Mm -hmm. And so your progress should never take the place of the promise that God has for you, the fulfillment of those things that are going to bring forth the fruit. And so some of you have been willing to call your progress your promise, and you've hung a hat on the things that you've seen happen short term, and as a result, you never truly see yourself walking in the victory or placing yourself in that place where you're ultimately going to see the fulfillment of what God has for you in your life. Some of you have somehow come to believe that your crumbs were acceptable in regards to his covenant. Folks, listen, your crumbs, God is not so desperate that we can offer the crumbs and somehow believe that God is going to build a covenant on those crumbs. No, God has got some clear directions. He's got some clear requirements to walk in the things of God. And none of those things involve the crumbs of our life. They involve the consecration of our life unto him. And some of us have thought that good intentions were equal to intimacy. Well, I intended to, I want to, I desire to, then why didn't you? Folks, good intentions will never take the place of intimacy with God. Man, I had planned on it, or I desired to. Folks, unless you do it, amen, you've not done it. Come on. And so what you said to yourself, I'm not gonna, I, I'm not gonna walk in the fulfillment of the things that God has for me. It's just gonna be a good idea for me. And so Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, he got started. But folks, there was a long way to go for this guy and a long time to go before he would see the promises of God fulfilled in and through his life. It says he was 75 years old when he left Haran. Or in other words, he was deep into the process of life. He was 75 years old. That's pretty deep into the process of life. And so look what it said. It says he took his wife. He took his nephew. He took his wealth. He took his livestock. And he took all the people that he had taken into that, into his household in Iran. I like the way it says that. He took his wife. He took his nephew. That's what he took. He took his wealth. He took his livestock. But you notice it said he picked up a lot of stuff in Iran. A lot of people decided, hey, listen, if this guy's going somewhere, I want to go with him. Some of those people probably had good intentions, and some of those people were probably looking for a free ride. Some of those people probably said, hey, this is a wealthy guy. Let me link myself with him because, man, then I can be blessed through him. And it says that he went to the house of Haran. Haran is a, is a word that means the crossroads. Isn't that interesting? 
that he took his wife, took his nephew, took his well, took his livestock, and all the people that he had taken into his life at the crossroads. Folks, isn't it amazing all the stuff that we can pick up on our way to the promise? Isn't it? I want you to leave. You're the Chaldees. And I want you to go to a place that I've called you to. A place of promise. When he left there, he was traveling light. And so that by the time he got to a place that God wanted to see the fulfillment, man, he had picked up all this baggage. Folks, what are the things that we hold on to on our way to the promises of God? When we come to those crossroads and God says, listen, you're either going to take that stuff with you or you're going to abandon it all for the sake of the call. And you're just going to move forward into the things that God has for you. And so we pick up all this stuff on the way to our promise. Sometimes when you come to the crossroads of your relationship with God, it's easier to advance or it seems easier to advance along the way when you have your hands full of stuff that can comfort you along the way. You hear me? God, I'm going to go as long as I have my hands full of stuff that I can depend upon. Folks, I remember uh, uh, November the, the 17th, 2003. The Lord, had, months ahead of time, had told Melanie and I to, 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 to leave, uh, leave our home country. And he told us, I want you to go to, to, to New Orleans. And you know what he told us? He told me in prayer, he said, listen, he specifically told me when to leave the 17th of November. And he told me exactly what I could take with me. And it wasn't much. It was my wife and a couple of children, an old beat-up bus, and our stuff uh, shoved in it, and $3,000, everything to our name that I took because I had a Suburban that I sold. That was the, everything of value we had. We didn't have uh, that in a bank account. We didn't have that in financial support. We didn't have that in a mission-sending agency that sent us out that was going to support. We didn't have That's all we had. We didn't have anything to go with us to the promise. We had to abandon all of those things. And we had to travel light. Folks, so I know what it means to practically have to make those decisions. But sometimes maintaining the stuff can sidetrack you from possessing the promise. Because what ends up happening, we get all this stuff in our life, all these thoughts, all this junk. And in order to maintain the stuff, we lose sight and we lose the time to focus upon the promises and the things that God has called us to. And so let me ask you a question. What have you accumulated at the crossroads of Haran? When you think to yourself, God's brought me to certain places, defining moments. There's been these places that God has. What have I uh, accumulated upon myself that's keeping me from advancing towards his promises? What about certain expectations? Have you accumulated certain expectations along the way that in reality have nothing to do with the promise of God for you, the directive? And so there's these expectations. Well, things should have been this way, or somebody should have appreciated me here. Folks, listen, God will, God will reveal those things to me. Have you ever thought that you should be recognized in a certain area or a certain ministry or something, and it's, all of a sudden it seems like nobody appreciates you, and, you and, and, and you're being phased out, or, or you're not recognized or whatever else? Well, chances are you've accumulated an attitude or a thought along the way that God wants to show you, listen, man, that's going to encumber you moving forward. People didn't, didn't see me for who I was or didn't appreciate me or, or maybe they were, they, 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 I kept seeing them really giving somebody else some, some props and I wasn't the one getting those. Well, maybe you picked up something on the path to Haran that God wants you to come, bring yourself to a place of humility. What about dangerous relationships? And folks, when we can talk about the, the, the snare of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an Ishmael, folks, listen, that's, that's one of the things that ensnare people so much. Listen, I can't even let go of a relationship with bad relationships with people. And so as a result, I'm going to find myself never going to be able to enter into the right relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So have you accumulated those times? I, I don't want to offend anybody. Folks, I don't want to offend God. I don't intentionally want to offend anybody. But I tell you what, in, in, in regards to, uh, to, to the place of offense, listen, it's God in this gaping hole than everybody else. You know what I'm saying? And so as long as I know that I'm in agreement with God, everybody else is ultimately probably going to have to get over it. Period. And so I don't want to dance around obedience to God in the hopes that everyone else can somehow understand where I'm coming from. I want to I stand and him say, well done, my good and faithful servant. If all, if, if all should forsake you, Lord God, I'm going to go with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set my face like that flint. I'm going to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. What about unconfessed sins? 
And so if you just file away and you think, listen, if I just ignore it long enough, it'll go away. Maybe just compromise in general. The thing that undid the church at Laodicea, neither hot or cold, but just a lukewarmness, compromise. Are you more known for your compromise or for your consecration? If those that are closest to you, if somebody says, listen, A or B, is this person more compromising or more concentrated? Consecrated, which one would you be? How about questionable intentions? What is the real intention of what you're doing? What's the motivation behind something? Or maybe even you've, you've accumulated fears and doubts or unbelief or unforgiveness and all these other things that you can gather in the hopes that they can comfort you somehow on the promises that God has for you. At verse 7, he said, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give you the land, this land, to your descendants. And it says, Abram built an altar where he dedicated the Lord who had appeared unto him. I want you to listen to the word of the Lord. He said, I will give it to your descendants. Folks, listen, here's what's interesting about that. Obviously, a descendant is an offspring. It's your posterity. It's your, your children. But literally, the word that they chose to use here is a word which is Zerah. He said, I will give it to your Zerah. And it means literally that which is sown, that which is raised, that which is used for food. That which is sown, that which is raised or cultivated, and that which is used for food. And so promises are not accumulating the stuff that we get at the crossroads, but cultivating the promises that are waiting for us in Canaan. Do I need to say that again? Yes. The promises of God are not things that are accumulated at Haran, but they're things cultivated at Canaan. That's where the promises of God are. There's something that's cultivated. Folks, listen, I can go out somewhere and gather. We can, we can leave right now and drive down to the, to, to the Walmart uh, neighborhood market, and we could go into the, uh, the, the, the produce section, and we could fill up baskets full of produce, having never dropped a seed in the ground, having never waited for the harvest, having never watered them, having never done anything in preparation, we could just go get all of those things and put bags under our arms and say, look what I have. Having never spent the time of cultivating a single vegetable. Period. But have you ever had somebody give you fresh vegetables and say, man, those are just so much better. They weren't put, they weren't gassed, or they weren't uh, manipulated, they weren't you know, uh, hybrids. They were something that came out of the seed. And I watched those things grow and I, I pulled them out of the dirt myself. Folks, that's the difference. So many people are just willing to accumulate things but never willing to cultivate things. Yeah. And so we want to eat somebody else's vegetable. We want to we want to take advantage of somebody else's prayer life. We want to we want to uh, uh, a piggyback off of someone else's faithfulness and ministry. But we never want to pay the price. I call it showing up. That's it. We don't want to have to grow up. We just want to show up. And so we just show up because somebody else has got up early. We just want to show up because somebody else has prayed. We want to just show up because somebody else has been there. We just want to show up after someone else has done all the work. And when we don't get recognized, we don't get blessed, we don't walk in the promise, then, well, what's the matter? Didn't I show up? We don't need to show up. You need to grow up. You need to allow God to begin to cultivate something in your life. You need to put your hand in the plow and allow God to plant that seed and to water those things and see those things come out of your life. And so don't think that God is impressed by that which you've accumulated or pilfered from the land. Well, look what I said. But didn't you hear that, that neat message I gave? Yeah, I heard it. I heard it from me first. Or from Pastor Alex or for somebody else. But did you hear that great revelation? Yeah, I heard it. I read the same book. So God is not impressed with our accumulation or something we pilfered from somebody else. God is looking for something that we're willing to pay the price in our own relationship with him. So don't think that God desires to deposit his promise within man's good intentioned efforts. God's not saying, well, you're good intentioned. I'm going to deposit my promise inside of there. What God wants to deposit his promise is in good man's intimacy, not man's efforts. And so don't think that your secondhand reclamation is the same as a firsthand revelation. 
Don't think that you can just claim something for somebody else and it's just as good as your own revelation. Folks, you've got to know God yourself. You can't have a second-hand Jesus because the second hand, that hand, is on somebody else, but you're going to find yourself running away from that promise. You've got to be a person that says, listen, regardless of whatever else, I know Jesus. I don't know Jesus because you're nice to me. I don't know Jesus because you encourage me. I know Jesus. And so if the Jesus I know is one that's built upon a personal relationship, then no other relationship can find me deviating from that. Yes. Folks, I meet people on the streets and say, listen, why aren't you serving God? Well, I got hurt in the church. Well, folks, there's bodybuilders get hurt in the gym when they show up the next week. You hear me? Football players get hurt on the field, and as soon as they, they get right, they go back to playing the game. And so they're willing to sacrifice a little pain. Do you hear me? For a sporting event, but we won't sacrifice a little difficulty for eternity. Do you hear me? I got hurt. Well, boo hoo hoo. You got hurt. Well, Jesus got crucified. How does that measure up? And so if our little hurt feelings are something that are going to get us out of the kingdom of heaven, what about the one that went all the way up, that he, he took your sorrows and your pains and your sins, and it was laid upon him, and they pierced his hands and feet. And he looked out at that multitude of mercy. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Folks, listen, our relationship with him has got to be a firsthand relationship. Otherwise, as soon as struggles and trials and sacrifices come, we'll hightail it. Yep. We'll find ourselves deviating right back into the same problems and the same mess and focusing on the same things that we brought along for the ride because we just never knew when we would need them again. Because God is calling us out in order to bring us in. Do you hear me? He's calling us out in order to bring us in. In. Folks, he's got promises for us. He's got promises for you. You hear me? Jason, he's got promises for you. Period. You may, be, you may walk a, along with Abraham like Lot, but he's got a promise for you. You hear me? Chrissy, he's got a promise for you. Douglas, he's got a promise for you. Chris, he's got a promise for you. Emily, he's got a promise for you. And so if he's got a promise for you, there's got to be an intimacy with him to get to that promise to understand what it is. Then what ends up happening? Well, faith begins to arise. Why? Because it comes from his word, and he is that word. Yep. And so I can see the seven promises fulfilled. Why? Because I'm willing to meet the three conditions to get to the promise. Yep. Yeah, God, in a broad sense, I do want to go to heaven. Yeah, that's a no-brainer. Kind of broad sense, I understand that there's certain things that I just can't do any longer. But God, in the narrow way, nothing survives but your promise. What are you accumulating or what have you accumulated at the crossroads? What have you tried to bring to the table to distract you from the things that God has for you? Will you stand to your feet this morning with me? See, this is the time, Pastor, that, you know, as a, as a preacher, that you, you know, you wish you had a, a, a bottle of something just to kind of splash on people and everything get fixed. You, you really wish that. You do. I mean, you, you wish you could shortcut people into it and flick some magic Jesus dust on them or have them run through a fire tunnel and everything's going to be okay. Folks, everything's not okay like that. Folks, that's what the, the, the church at, at large, the quote-unquote spirit-filled church has created some bombastic thing that they think God's impressed with just a moment. No, God's not impressed with your moment. Right. He's impressed with your motivation as long as it's right. What is it right? That's what God's looking for. He's looking for an enduring to the end. Not just showing up, but a growing up. Not just gathering, but cultivating something in your life. What have you been cultivating in your heart? What have you cultivated in your relationship with Jesus? Or are you just hanging on to somebody else's obedience? Well, shame on you. Because your grip will eventually loosen. 
and you'll tumble into a place and you'll find yourself no longer walking in step with him according to Amos 3.3. Bow your head and close your eyes just for a second. Father, all over the